Good morning, everybody. I, I get very excited at conferences like this because I think about how I first contacted the sea, really made contact and felt uh, the ocean. And for me, it was all about diving. I grew up in a place called Romford, Essex, which is as far from the wild, the natural wild places. It's close to some urban wild places, but it's a long way from the natural wild places. And it's a hell of a long way from the sea. I was failing at school. I couldn't do anything to do with like classic learning. But every week on my television, this black and white television at home, I was watching Jacques Cousteau. And he was, you know, having these ultimate adventures. He was out there with his team on Calypso. I, hadn't, I didn't know that I was only 11. I didn't know he'd co-invented scuba diving. I didn't understand any, anything of the science. But his journeys were, for me, that's terrific. And Hans Huss was making those fantastic black and white shark documentaries. I know now he was using ex-military rebreather gear, but I didn't know that. I was watching this man swimming around with sharks. And then my ultimate hero, all happening at the same time, was this great guy, Mike Nelson, who popped up on my television screens every week in a television program called Sea Hunt. I barely knew that it was just a story. I thought, it was, you know, to me, it was as close to real life as could be imagined. He was having proper, you know, blokes' adventures in the sea. Every week he seemed to be rescuing men from flooded mines or rescuing pilots from crashed jets. And the best thing for me as a little boy was that all the beautiful women in the world fell in love with Mike and wanted him to teach them to dive. And I thought, that's for me. Who needs the books and who needs teachers? And I want to be like Mike Nelson. And I, that was the thing that kept me going is that somehow I knew I could escape school early. And in those days, it was pretty easy to leave school if you um, passed anything. And young ones like me who were struggling in school, uh, it was always a good relief for the teachers too, I now understand, that if they could get you through one single subject, you could be gone. And uh, me and a bunch of my friends, uh, we managed to pass metalwork. Um, uh, metalwork O-level, it's called, a grand title, metalwork ordinary level. And that meant we could escape. And I went into diving. I went to be a commercial diver. And for me, I still remember 1969 having my first dive in the English Channel at a place called Portland Bill. And, I, and you had to make your own suits. And so I had my suit. And it was like a, like a dress pattern, like a lady's dress pattern. You lay out the paper on the neoprene, cut it and glue it together. And obviously, to put the tape on, uh, I went for the yellow tape, a la Cousteau. And then on that first dive in the channel, Easter 1969, the sense of the ocean coming in that leaky suit and what it felt like. And I was alive and I knew, I couldn't have described it then as the world's largest, least understood, least protected ecosystem and arguably the most powerful. But for me, that moment, I feel that moment here in front of you and every time I go diving. And it's something that we should think of when we communicate. As Francesco kindly said, I now work for National Geographic Pristine Seas. Um, we're a, a group of um, uh, scientists, uh, filmmakers, and um, dare I say it, almost politicians in our efforts to get things done. And this is where we work, we had 21 expeditions, and uh, here's a short video as to how and why we do it. We are defined by the environments that we live in. When they say, where do you come? The first thing that comes to my mind is the reef, the forest, the corals. Maybe that's who I am. The moment I set my eyes on these remote islands, I know why we're here. This place is melting like a popsicle in Arizona in the summertime. Big fish are gone. They have been fished out. It only takes a few fishing boats and they can remove hundreds of years of biomass in just a very short period of time. After 10 years as a professor, I realized that I was just writing the obituary of the ocean. I quit academia and assembled a team to do something about it. I want to show to the world what the ocean was like hundreds of years ago and why we have to preserve them. It 
This is one of these rare places on Earth, a time machine, where we can see the ocean of the past. What we do is hunt out the last pristine places in the ocean and protect them. The ocean has amazing regenerative power. We just need to let it heal itself. In one single pulse, in one immeasurably powerful heartbeat, the ocean has just changed my life. realize that one approach one approach for the ocean would be to not just raise awareness or not just keep doing science which are the two sort of classical sort of paths that have opened up but look at the ocean in a very different way look at it as to something that we're always taking from you know we put it under pressure by everything we take from it we put it under pressure by the way we're warming up and the pollution and all these you know we can all spend all morning listing all the all the sort of stresses we put on the ocean but what about thinking about it as a bank account? You know, we're constantly taking, what do we ever put back into the ocean? So let's go find the last wild places, the truly pristine places, and protect them. A bit like putting money in the bank, a bit like buying a bit of time. And to communicate the value of them, we needed three things. We need the science, really good world-class science. We needed a way to tell the story, so we need compelling media, because not we discovered that not every politician reads big, thick science reports. Um, and we need some form of political influence. So they are the three legs that hold us together, and of course, a great bunch of terrific partners to make things happen all over the world. And we have, we should all celebrate that we're in this terrific sweet spot. As I was beginning to list these things last night, I realized that we could speak for hours just running through all the wonderful, wonderful, almost unthinkable, terrific successes that we've all achieved. But the one thing I really like about them, if I had to sort of define them with a common denominator, is the lovely clear language that we're all using. We're not, we, this is language that, you know, my mum would celebrate and understand. Everybody would understand this. And, and, you know, most people, I would think, even those that voted for Trump, would probably understand that this is good news for the ocean and it's significant and it's important. And people like Tommy, you know, um, in Palau, I don't know how many, some of you are obviously in Hawaii, and you remember Tommy's speech, you know, here's the president, and he was so excited, he calls out to Obama, come on, you know, we're protecting 80% of our oceans, you know, so you should join the big leagues, and then he sang. I mean, who can't help uh, but love, uh, you know, president of an island nation who's leading the way with ocean protection, and he's singing at conferences, and, you know, we've got lovely, clear, motivational language uh, revolving around ocean conservation and things that are very surprising we had no idea that Ecuador I mean I spent my life working in ocean conservation issues and Enric said to me one day how much of the Galapagos do you think is protected and I had this knee-jerk reaction I said well I thought I'd, I've been there twice I had the whole feeling that it was protected and but it wasn't it was when you look at the map there was just a tiny little bits and pieces of the Galapagos was actually protected so through pristine seas we did some work and it's now, the whole upper part is now protected. It's the largest, as you know, shark, uh, shark population on the planet. We've had some lovely surprises. We didn't think that France would go for Clipperton quite so quickly, but they used the uh, Our Oceans Conference coming up and the whole, what feels to me as if global leaders almost queuing up behind each other to make global ocean announcements. And thank heavens, uh, the great uh, Les uh, Segalin uh, signed in uh, Clipperton just very recently but each one needs a different approach. You know, we shouldn't think that each one of our successes that we all share is the same template. Every single island or ocean nation has to have its own approach, how it works. Obviously, we've got science. There's a sense of telling the story, whether it's our compelling media or science reports that are so exciting you just can't put them down, and also some sense of political influence. And here's a good example, Seychelles. Um, Seychelles are terrific oceanic community as you all know and very proud 
oceanic people, but they live in a very complicated structure as to how the islands are managed. And there's a lot of pressure from the tuna industry, from mining. How are they going to manage it? And they were carrying an extraordinary amount of international debt. So they came up with part of the blue economy. And they, they are now sort of global leaders on the blue economy. I've represented them in Abu Dhabi at the Blue Economy Conference, and they hold themselves out there as we are a good example as to how to have a blue economy. And they afforded it by the Club of Paris arrangement with offsetting debt, which was put together with the Nature Conservancy, as you well know. And our bit in it was to realise that the outer islands, particularly the Aldabra group, which they plan on... Uh, well, they're committed to 100% protection of the Aldabra group, and it's 30% protection of all of their EEZ. 15, uh, half of that will be no take. The Aldabra group are hard to get to, it's expensive to get to, and there was gaps in the science. So that's where we came in. We, there was a lot of us all pulling together. We went in and did the science on the Aldabra group, and then what we normally do, of course, as well as the science report, is we produce a film. We haven't got time to show the, the full film, but this is the style of film that we do for all of the projects. It carries important messages, and this is the short version that the Seychelles, they like to show it on their television regularly. The sea is really our lifeline. It's not only an issue of economics, it's really about emotions. People are bound to, to the sea. You know, our life really depends on that. The Seychelles are people, I think perhaps more than many other nations, understand that we're an oceanic nation. We live through the sea, and therefore, to make sure that we are able to benefit in the future, to make sure that our children benefit, we have to protect to benefit. We are 99% ocean and only 1% land. Under the sea, it is a painting come to life. In 1998, when we had the coral bleaching and all the corals then died, and I remember going back into the water and seeing all the destruction. So at the back of my mind, I was still searching for those coral gardens and I couldn't find them. The reality of the trend of what's happening in terms of the rise in temperature and in terms of the rise of, of sea temperature is that there's going to be some sort of event like this that's going to happen. We can only be a viable and growing society if our marine environment is healthy. How do you best prepare that these events are actually going to happen? And how do you make sure that you can bounce back? Marine protected areas play a key role towards that. We just went diving today in the main channel, and that was amazing. Um, corals everywhere fish by abundance. The healthier your core ecosystem, the better prepared it is to bounce back from these warming events that can have a huge impact on the marine environment. If we want to protect them fully, we should consider really of expanding our marine reserve. That's, that's a good aim to, to move towards. And we are on the verge of creating one of the largest marine protected area. We've already committed to protect 30% of our exclusive economic zone. Obviously each country is going to have its own specific requirements and the Seychelles wanted a long film, uh, about 45 minutes to show on television and to travel with. Um, of course, they have a science report first, then the film, and then some short films that they could keep showing regularly on television. And their request with this one was that they had Didier Dogley, the first big man you saw speaking, who's the environment minister, uh, Jean-Paul Adam, the man after him, who's the minister of finance and blue economy, and most importantly, that the important messages were carried by the young ones. 
which is great for us because that means on our expedition we just have a big young, bunch of young ones coming. And they also wanted behind the scenes footage. You know, the Seychelles Wild have a terrific sense of humour and they wanted all these little bits um, behind the scenes, which can be fun. And uh, they love to show this one uh, before the news in Seychelles. I'm Paul Rose, expedition leader for National Geographic Pristine Seas. And this is Aldabra, one of the wildest places on the planet. It's, it's inhospitable. Come on. We need a tougher camera. I got it. He can't stay away from me. <laughs> and, and, of, and of course, that, that works perfectly for, for, for people who are just trying to see what does go behind the scenes. And, it, and in some countries, it just doesn't work. Um, you know, we, we tried this. We've got great contacts with Russia. Um, we remember in 2010 when Putin stood on Franz Josef Land and made a, an announcement that he would like this to be the hub of, um, of a large uh, protected area in the Arctic. And yet, um, it took many years and, and, and much cooperation with, the, with our, our colleagues in Russia, and we put this whole project together. But it, do, it didn't really feel that we could spend a long time traveling around Russia making inside jokes and behind the scenes jokes. It's just different sort of language culture. So for them, we produced a grand one hour film. Uh, we managed to find the Russian equivalent of David Attenborough to do the narration. Uh, apologies, I forget his name. Great man. So it's a real grand, beautiful film. And of course, that with our partners all helped to bring in uh, the Franz Joseph announcement, which of, that was made the same day that Obama made the announcement of, of the Atlantic project as well. So everything was happening almost in a, in a rush to get this good news out for the oceans. Um, and it also depends how we tell the story. I mean, here's the, the UK story. We, um, in the UK, have just committed 20 million and a lot of resources to uh, something which we call the Blue Belt. Uh, it was, Blue Ca it was uh, Cameron's initiative to have all of the UK overseas territories protected in a sense of a Blue Belt around the planet. And we can either report that news as, you know, we're going to ban the fishing, which is, gets one audience in there, or another one that we're going to double the marine protected areas. It doesn't matter, but you, you know, I, th I see now that editors are being very careful with their language, answering the right, you know, sort of answering that question as to who's going to listen and what's going to motivate people. Um, and in that UK overseas territories, this started because our first one was Pitcairn. We spent many years working on Pitcairn Islands. Um, and we had a beautiful science report, and I think we've got some colleagues here today that we collaborate with on that. We did the science report any way you like, big, grand, beautiful things, small ones, published reports, fold out, four pages with lots of photographs. We did a one-hour film, a 30-minute film, a 20-minute film. Uh, I made four talks in the House of Commons. Uh, one of them was Sylvia Earle, and we couldn't seem to push it over the edge. Uh, the government were, felt it was risky to sign in Pitcairn. Uh, they didn't understand the issues. We were killing ourselves with ways of communicating the importance. And then eventually the geniuses in DC came up with this one minute 30 animation.
were some terrific messages in there that were accurate, but the two things that I take home from this all the time is the sense of competition, you know, here's what Obama has done, look at that, and the sense of it being non-branded. At the end, it just comes up with a union flag. Um, so it wasn't uh, a great list of all of us that had ever worked on it, uh, the classic thing, thanks to this and thanks to that. It was UK branded already. And it was that simple, simple message that carried it across. And I have great memories on that, of on the fifth uh, House of Commons talk. You know what M ministers are like, they're always running off to vote, there's a bell and they have to go vote. Their, you know, their attention span has to be quite short on these things. And so we gave out a large number of iPads with, with that uh, animation constantly running and uh, all credit to politicians and against uh, uh, stereotypes we got them all back so um, and then of course you know with this vast pile of successes and each one has got its own trick and it's all about you know the science it's all about the compelling media and telling the stories and something that we all know so well don't we is it is what is it's going to motivate the decision you know who is the decision maker you know what does the the, the, what does the minister need at that moment? Is it a legacy? Is it a quick win? Is it, you know, what is it that these people need to make the decision and push sensible uh, global leading ocean, ocean conservation over the edge into success? And similarly here, you know, I mean, you know, who ever would have thought that, that, that the Ross Sea would have come in after all these years of everybody and against it? But uh, by a huge... Uh, pile of support. I think everybody in this, in this great hall was probably working on it and hundreds of others. Um, it happened and something we should celebrate. And I have to say, I would have thought this was completely unlikely, particularly at this event. How many were at this great event at the end of the uh, uh, World Ocean Census? I, was, I had hoped some would be, but it was held, it was held in London and uh, Museum of Natural History, which is a grand, oh, great, grand, beautiful occasion. And even though it had been the end of 10 years and there'd been all these great things and 6,000 new species discovered and all these things, it felt as if we were really up against it. We were all there. Copenhagen had just happened. We were here doing this glorious multinational, multi-million dollar event, celebrating, and yet, what was really going to happen? It felt like not much was going to happen. So some things have changed that's helped made that happen. It's not just political will. Technically, we now can monitor vessels. We've got a great success recently. We can watch what's going on around protected areas. We're almost at the end, dare I say it, of illegal fishing. We're celebrating. It's not unusual to see this kind of stuff in the newspapers. And because blowing up fishing vessels, well, yeah, it's almost become old hat. We see it on the news all the time. And things like this, South Korea threatening to shoot boats. We never used to see this kind of stuff to protect the ocean. And we also reach that thing. We, we change when we have to, don't we? We modify behavior when we have to. And there's some things that are frightening us now that are making us do the right thing. They're sort of galvanizing us into action. We signed that. China had to come up to Trump and say, hey, we didn't uh, make up global warming. These are threatening things. Um, at, at Marrakesh, there were some wonderful successes where the world's poorest countries, least developed countries, are leading the way on sustainable development. And this is all, I think, partly because of the threat of big global leaders who maybe don't understand it. And I look at the Trump election and think, well, this is something that is actually helping people realize just how bad it could possibly get. So we can look at those challenges, and we're brave enough to look at new challenges. I'm very excited about the high seas. It's been on our minds for so many years, hasn't it, as to what about the high seas? We talk about EZs, we talk about marine protected areas. What about the high seas? Well, we're now in the business of realizing that this can actually happen. And the way we do that and the way we tell that story is so very important. And I'll leave you with a very short film that has such a thump to it that it's my equivalent of me explaining that first dive in Portlandville in 1969. And this is the way, I think, is a way to tell very powerful ocean stories and what it means to us, and something for us to keep in mind. Could we turn the volume up a little bit, please? Just a little bit. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you.